Oh, man. I forgot that I had changed from the lecture. Okay, I keep forgetting to do this. Remember, I completely had my mind go blank, and I couldn't remember how to do the telescope magnification. That evening, I was talking to my wife and saying, ah, it's so embarrassing, I couldn't remember. Something so easy, and then, of course, it pops into my brain. And you'll see right here, it really is easy. So telescope magnification, you have the objective. Why is it called the objective? Because it's the lens that's facing the object. That's all there is to it. And then you have the eyepiece over here. So you have your eyeball back behind that eyepiece. You have your object. Where's the object placed? You don't have much choice, right? So where is it going to be? Well, it's going to be on the other side of the objective, but how close? With the telescope, the object is approaching infinity far away. So that means that you're going to have an image that is formed at the, okay, let's change that to black. Draw the principal axis here. The image is going to be formed at the focal point of the objective because the object distance is effectively infinitely far away. Because the object is effectively infinitely far away, if I take the vertex ray, that vertex ray is going to have the angle that my eye would see if I was looking at the object. So that's the angle that I would have without using the telescope. Now I have the eyepiece, and the eyepiece is to help me see more clearly, to magnify it. And if I'm using the eyepiece with unaccommodated viewing, what does it mean to say it's unaccommodated viewing? It's a relaxed eyeball. The eyeball is relaxed, meaning that it's focused at its far point, which for our purposes, we treat everybody as having perfect vision with the far point of infinity. So once again, if I take the vertex ray going out to the image at infinity, that's going to give me the angle that's seen through the telescope. So magnification is just the ratio of those. And now life gets kind of easy. There is one thing that's not in this equation, and that's a minus sign. A minus sign because I started with an object out at infinity that was upright, and I end up with an image at infinity that's inverted. Both object and image are infinitely far away, and it seems if you just look at the distances, you might not have gained anything because you're still focused on something very far away. But the point of the telescope is not to make something far away appear close is to make something far away make a bigger angle with the eye. And so I have to put that minus sign because it's inverted. And then I just use geometry. This theta incident is equal to the height of my image divided by the focal length of the objective, right? Say, say right. Okay, just want to make sure people hear me. That's based on the small angle approximation. I'll write this in with the small angle approximation versus the technically correct inverse tangent of, well, I'll write the other way. Tangent of theta incident is equal to the opposite side, which is the height of the image, over the adjacent side, which is focal length of the objective. But for small angles, that's approximately equal to theta incident. That's why I had to say right. Now for the eyepiece, if the image is at infinity, then the object has to be at the focal length. So I have the triangle for the eyepiece, tangent theta, I call it T here, is equal to the height of the image divided by focal length of the eyepiece, which is approximately equal to theta T. So now if I divide those two, 
the magnification is equal to minus because it's inverted height of the image over focal length of the eyepiece divided by height of the image over focal length of the objective good news the height of the image didn't matter to the calculation because those cancel out and I have this is just equal to minus focal length of the objective over focal length of the eyepiece. That's how we derive the magnification for a telescope. You can see it was really simple. I just forgot at the wrong time. And I know that happens on tests. It's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you as well. That is the end of material that will be on our next exam. That's the end of our optics discussions. We'll have the exam next Tuesday. And we will start now with new material. What's the new material? We're going to start studying relativity. In 1905, Albert Einstein wrote three groundbreaking papers. Two of those are very specific to what we're going to be studying for the remainder of the semester. One of them is actually something we've already talked about. So let's go to the one that's related to what we've already talked about. One of those papers was about Brownian motion. How many people have studied Brownian motion? I would have thought everyone. We studied it in high school biology, we saw the biology I have. Brownian motion, I think it's Robert Brown, right? was looking at little pollen floating in water through a microscope, and he saw the pollens moving, vibrating. And so he concluded that this must be the result of, quote, cavorting beasties. I really remember my high school biology class. What are those cavorting beasties? Well, he thought that this must be, you know, some microscopic type of animal. But in 1905, Einstein wrote a paper saying, no, no, it's because, remember, temperature is a measurement that's telling us about the kinetic energy of the molecules. Those water molecules are moving about, and the pollens have such a small mass that they actually get a reasonable acceleration from the collisions of water atoms hitting them, or water molecules, excuse me. And so you're actually seeing the result of water molecules bouncing off of the pollen. So that's his first paper. Second paper, which is the one we're studying here, I, and I'm not doing these in necessarily chronological order, but in order of what I think are the perceived importance, was on a theory of special relativity. Now, when I say special, what does special imply to you? Okay, does it follow the norm? What do you say, Ashley? In a specific case. In a specific case. Any others? An exception. An exception? Okay, these are all good, good definitions. The one that is most apt to the way it's used here by Einstein is in a specific case. Special relativity is a specific case of relativity and then 10 years later, he wrote a paper on a general theory of relativity. The general is the broad one. The general is the hard one that we're not going to touch here. We might mention it just a little bit. The special is the simpler case. So we're going to look at the simpler case. The math is generally going to be simple. The ideas are pretty mind-bending. So what does this relativity say? It starts with the work of Galileo. You see I have Galilean relativity there. Galileo is the person who gets credit, at least, for starting to say, well, if I observe Lauren walking, I measure her speed to be this. What if a different observer, let's say um, Angelina, observes Lauren walking? What is Angelina going to measure? That's what relativity is. It's comparing the measurements in one situation to the measurements in another situation of the same thing. And so we're going to talk about that more carefully. I won't go further right now. His third paper 
the one that I have ranked the most important because it's the one for which he got a Nobel Prize was on the particle nature of light. What did we study in lab yesterday? The wave nature of light. He got a Nobel Prize for the particle nature of light. Newton had believed that light was a particle. Yay. Except for Thomas Young proved that he was wrong. Remember, in physics, you can't prove you're right. You can prove somebody else is wrong. And so Thomas Young's experiment was the double slit diffraction. Yesterday, you studied multiple slit diffraction, and you saw that the light can be explained as interference of waves, but it can't be explained as two particles going through the slits. And so Young proved that Newton was wrong. And now Einstein comes in, and he says, Newton was right, but we have an experiment that proved him wrong. And Einstein proposed an experiment called the photoelectric effect that will be, I think, the last lab activity we do that proved Young was wrong. And now you should really feel bad. We just did experiments yesterday that confirmed Young's solution that light is a wave. And then we're going to do for our last laboratory experiment that proves that, that Young was wrong, light's not a wave. Our current understanding is that light has two natures. It's both particle and wave. And sometimes you'll see manifestations of the particle behavior. Sometimes you'll see manifestations of the wave behavior. So that's the one that he got the, the Nobel Prize for. We call the things that come after Einstein wrote these papers modern physics. So things after 1905 is in the category of modern physics. And quantum physics, our understanding of the, whoops, our understanding of how chemistry works, those are modern physics. Chemistry is not modern, but our understanding of how it works is modern. So let's get into it. First, a fundamental basis. If you make a measurement very carefully without making errors, then your measurement should be valid. So measurements made in any two reference frames should be equally valid. We can't say, oh, your measurement's wrong because you're in the wrong reference frame. We can say it's different, but not wrong. We're equally valid. So that's one of our first principles of relativity. Now I have here an example of, you know, you see two people walking hand in hand on a moving sidewalk airport, and they might walk at 1.3 meters per second with respect to a reference frame that's on the sidewalk. So you're on this moving sidewalk, just moseying at 1.3 meters per second. Um, somebody who is on the moving sidewalk and not moving would measure you as moving relative to them at what speed? 1.3 meters per second. But if that moving sidewalk itself is moving at 2.4 meters per second, and there's somebody who's standing in the airport watching you, how fast would they say you're going? The sidewalk's moving at 2.4 meters per second, and you're moving at 1.3 meters per second with respect to it. So you'd have 3.7 meters per second. That's what relativity is all about. Who's right in that case? They're both right. The person on the sidewalk says, with respect to this moving sidewalk, you're moving 1.3 meters per second. The person standing off the moving sidewalk says, with respect to the airport, you're moving at 3.7 meters per second. And they're both correct. There's no contradiction. And so Galileo understood that very simply. And Galileo would say that we can add these by saying, the velocity of the person with respect to the sidewalk is equal to 1.3 meters per second. The velocity of the sidewalk with respect to the earth is equal to 2.4 meters per second. And thus the velocity of the person with respect to the earth is equal to the velocity of the person with respect to the sidewalk plus the velocity of the sidewalk with respect to the earth is equal to 1.3 meters per second plus 2.4 meters per second 
is equal to 3.7 meters per second. Now notice in the Galilean relativity, these inner indices were the same thing. The speed of the object with respect to a reference frame plus the speed of that reference frame with respect to a different one gives me the speed of my object in the other reference frame. So the extremes are the two that I'm looking for for the indices and the ones in the center are the same. So that's how Galilean relativity works. Anybody have any confusion about Galilean relativity? It's really straightforward, right? It's something you would have understand, understood, you know, long before taking a physics class. So what's Einstein going to do that's any different from that? Something so simple. Well, first we have to define something about the reference frames and that is an inertial reference frame. Inertial reference frame is a term that we as physicists will throw around willy nilly. You need to understand what inertia is. So somebody define inertia. An object's what? Okay, an object's resistance to acceleration. And we have Newton's law of inertia, the first law, that says an object stays in constant motion unless it's acted on by an outside force. An inertial reference frame is a reference frame in which that holds true. Anybody a little bit concerned that I just said there might be reference frames where Newton's first law doesn't apply? Everything we've done, just assume Newton's first law was correct. So what's an example where it wouldn't apply? We have to define an inertial reference frame. We've got to know a non-inertial reference frame. Here's an easy example for a non-inertial reference frame. Let us say that you are in an airplane and you have your tray table down and on the tray table you have an egg, a hard boiled egg sitting there. And the airplane is going to take off. So you're sitting there in the airplane and you're looking at that egg you're looking at the seat in front of you, the seat in front of you is stationary. It never moves. That tray table never moves. But when you take off, what happens to the egg? It's going to accelerate toward you. Why is it accelerating toward you? Okay, the airplane was accelerating forward. So the airplane was exerting a force on you making you accelerate. That egg in the Earth reference frame, it's just sitting here, inertia is opposing that, and it came toward you in the Earth reference frame, it stays put while you accelerate into it. But in your reference frame, you stay in the seat stationary, and the egg accelerates toward you. So in that case, the egg did not obey the law of inertia, it accelerates toward you. What was the true reason for this? your reference frame was accelerated. So a non-inertial reference frame is a reference frame that is accelerated. And we encounter those all the time. When you're in a car and you go around a corner, you think of the car as being stationary if you're not the driver or you know if you're a kid in the back seat. But in fact, you know that the car is moving. When you turn, the car is accelerating, it's changing direction. And inertia is gonna to try to keep you in a straight line that door pushes in on you for no apparent reason, well, it's because your reference frame is accelerating. So here is another practical example. I love these examples, spinning on, on a merry-go-round. Spinning on the merry-go-round, if you're on the merry-go-round, if you throw the ball straight to somebody across from you, based on your reference frame, it's not going to get to them. It's not going to get to them because you are accelerating. They're accelerating. You throw the ball, once it leaves your hand, it has no horizontal acceleration in the Earth's reference frame, right? Because the Earth is an inertial reference frame. So it'll go in a straight line as observed by the Earth. 
what you see on the right hand side. But if you're sitting on the merry-go-round, it's going to appear to curve. Does that make sense? Now, when I was in graduate school, we had a teeter totter that was set up so it could rotate, and we put in the physics lab to illustrate this. And you're supposed to go around slowly, throw the ball to your friend, and you have to lead them. You throw it out this way, and then it looks like it curved into them. And everybody that's standing outside says, no, you just led them. They got to it. Well, after lab was over, a couple of my lab students and I were having a little more fun. Let's go faster. Let's see if we can throw it to ourselves. You know, throw it out there and come around fast enough that I just catch the ball I threw. It's a good thing to do, right? And that's, that's good physics. It's fun. Except for we weren't exactly the same way. And as we're going really fast, it slid. And I was coming straight for this corner, so I leaned forward because I'm no idiot. So I leaned forward, but the teeter totter hit that and broke off the leg of the lab desk. Physics is dangerous. <laughs> Unfortunately, I escaped injury. But it was all illustrating this. Next time you go to the park, you need to take a ball, you need to make it spin really, really fast, and play around. Observe some non inertial reference frame physics because it's fun. So this is a. Uh, answer all of, oh, come on. Answer all that are correct. So you got to put in your answers, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and hit enter. See if we understand this inertial reference frame idea. Which of the following is an inertial reference frame? And I'm going to call on four people to explain why A, B, C, and D are yes or no's, just so you are ready. Okay, still waiting on Christian, Ashley, Corso, Erica, Angelina. Oh, it's valid. <laughs> now down to Ashley and Corso. Corso is in, just Ashley. Should be web fizz. Okay, while she's getting there, let's start with James. James, the stationary car, is that inertia or not inertial? It is. Why? Perfect. It's constant velocity, so it is. Good, Ashley answered twice. <laughs> it's, it's okay, there's no problem with that. Okay, next one. Next one goes to Angelina. A car traveling at constant velocity, is that going to be inertial or non-inertial? And why? Yes. yes, and why? Okay, constant velocity, so acceleration is zero. Next up is Brittany. A car accelerating straight. Okay. Okay. No, because the velocity is changing. That's correct. Final one to Noah. The velocity is what? And so that makes it which one? Not inertial. Perfect. You understood the difference between inertial and non-inertial. And almost everybody did. We had 17, 18, 
two and four. So if those answers didn't make sense to you, make sure that you get that straight in your mind for the end of the semester. So some postulates of relativity. First, we have things we're going to ignore. Is the Earth accelerating? The technical answer is yes. Name some things that are making us accelerate. Like, why am I accelerating right here, right now? OK, we had rotation and we had orbit. The Earth is orbiting around the sun, which means that we're changing direction. We're rotating about our axis, which means we're changing direction. So those two things are both giving us accelerations. There is more than that. The Earth is also orbiting the galactic center, which gives it another acceleration. So we have all of these accelerations, but they're small numbers. They're small enough that we will treat them as zeros. So we'll treat the Earth as inertial, even though, in fact, it's a little bit different from inertial. Now, I have to point this out. I've already talked about the flat Earthers a lot. The flat Earthers just get completely boggled by things like the Earth's rotation and acceleration. You know, if the Earth is spinning, why aren't you flying off of the surface of the Earth? Right? According to Newton's laws, we should travel in a straight line unless something acts on us. So if the Earth is spinning, and the speed of the surface of the Earth is, you know, like 1,000 miles an hour. So why does 1,000 miles an hour throw us off the surface of the Earth? Well, we are traveling like 1,000 miles an hour going around a circle. We have gravity pulling us down. And remember, the acceleration due to that rotation is v squared over r. The radius from the center of the Earth to us is, is a big number. And so the actual acceleration that is necessary for us to maintain on the surface of the Earth is something like 1 100th the acceleration of gravity. It's in that ballpark. So we're not falling off the surface of the Earth because the acceleration of gravity is like 100 times bigger than the acceleration we would need to stay on the surface. So the force of gravity is holding us down, no problem. And then they say, you know, if the Earth is hurtling through space and the galaxy, you know, we have all this motion, we should all be dizzy and no. They don't understand the difference in speed and acceleration. Okay, so we're gonna treat the Earth as an inertial reference frame, even though it's not. Yeah, we can go by that. This here is another application of Galilean relativity. This is a setup question, so keep your clickers handy. A bus is traveling at 20 meters per second. A student walks toward the front of the bus at two meters per second. How fast is the student traveling with respect to the road? Yes. <laughs> yes. So I have the velocity of the bus with respect to the earth is 20 meters per second. Velocity of student with respect to the bus is two meters per second. What's the velocity of the student with respect to the, I should put earth. So. Jeff, Rebecca, and Edward. Okay. This is not nearly so good as the other ones we've done. Because I thought this would be pretty clear cut. Let's go to Jeff. Which one? B. And what's your reason for B? You add them. He's very succinct. We had Galilean relativity that said, 
the velocity of the student with respect to the earth is equal to velocity, and I'm going to have the first index is this one here, plus velocity, and the second index will be this one here. And then I have to have the same index for the inner ones. And so for the inner ones, I'm going to have the bus. And so you just put those in. Velocity of the student with respect to the bus is 2 meters per second. Velocity of bus with respect to the earth is 20 meters per second <laughs> equals 22 meters per second. Okay, simple. Now I told you that was a setup question. A spaceship is traveling at 0 0.80 times the speed of light. So we just usually say 0 0.80c. So that's the speed of the spaceship relative to the Earth. And it fires a torpedo at 0 0.40c. That's the speed of the torpedo with respect to the spaceship. And it's asking, how fast is the torpedo with respect to the Earth? Okay, James Nashley. Okay, we're all in. The answers we had were 5, 14, and 1. Now, there's a good to this and there's a bad to this. The good to this is that 14 of you answered perfectly consistently with the answer that we got from Jeff. The bad of it is that whole mickelson morley experiment thing. Try as they might, they couldn't find any situation that would change the speed of light and vacuum from C. Experiment after experiment, doesn't matter how fast you're moving and what direction you're moving, the speed of light in your reference frame is always the speed of light and vacuum. Well, the speed of light and vacuum is always the same. And so from the best of our experimental results, this isn't the right answer. The best of our experimental results is going to be slower than the speed of light and vacuum. And so we take as a, an assumption of relativity that nothing can exceed the speed of light and vacuum and the speed of light and vacuum is the same in every reference frame. Well, what about our Galilean relativity? You, you can see now where Einstein's coming in. Our Galilean relativity, we're just getting a handle on, and now it doesn't work. So that's where Einstein comes in. That's where special relativity is going to come in. We've got to figure out how fast is this going because Everyone knows 0.8 plus 0.4 is 1.2, not less than 1. So from James Clerk Maxwell's equations, we have the speed of light and vacuum is this. That is now an exact number. That's set as a constant in science. And if anything is ever measured more precisely, it's the definition of how long a meter is that changes, not the speed of light and vacuum. So that's what we are considering a universal constant, speed of light and vacuum. And it's the same in every inertial reference frame. So here is a more straightforward application because we know the answer. We have a race car. And this is actually what Einstein started out with. Just for your humor, I was once at a comedy club, and the person next to me apparently had also been studying physics, and we started talking about this very problem, and we got animated enough that the comedian had to tell us to shut up. You know how we nerds are. We can get excited about our physics. So you have a car, 
And this car can go really, really fast. So let's suppose that this car can go, oh, let's start with the speed of light. Why not have a car that goes the speed of light? So if this, star, if this car is going the speed of light and it turns on its headlights, what happens? If you're in a car, your reference frame is in that car, you're traveling at constant speed, that's inertial reference frame, you turn on the headlights, what happens? <laughs> okay, Gila's car, nothing happens. I'm sorry about your car, Gila. <laughs> In my car, when I turn on the headlights, light goes out in front of me. How fast is it traveling? Speed of light, because that's a rule. Now, we're pretending air is vacuum here because it's very similar. So I turn, I'm in the car, I'm the driver of the car, I turn the headlights, the light's going out at the speed of light. But somebody on Earth sees me traveling at the speed of light. And when I turn on my headlights, how fast are they going to see the light leaving my car? 'Cause my car's already traveling the speed of light, but I can't leave. And so Einstein was like, well, something's wrong here. Either this person's right or this person's right, or I guess there's a third option. They're both wrong. So Einstein said, well, what would happen if the person on Earth was right? You could get out of the car. Yeah, okay, so now you now you're able to walk on the hood or whatever. You get out there and you go out and you say, ah, yes, the electric field is like this here and like this here and like this here. And you have stationary electric fields for your electromagnetic wave because it's not moving. If the person on Earth is right, the light's not moving forward. Well, that doesn't make sense. You can't have a stationary electromagnetic wave. It's a wave if it's moving. And so this got Einstein to really thinking about that. And he said, there, there's got to be some other way. So here are the actual postulates within which we get that other way. So the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. So everything that I have taught you should be the same in every inertial reference frame. Now you can breathe a little sigh of relief because I haven't been teaching you complete nonsense. Or so I say. I also told you the very beginning of the first semester, you should never just take what the teacher says as the gospel. Not to undermine me or any other teacher, but you do need to be convinced in your own mind, much like the Bereans. What did the Bereans do, all you religious students? They searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were true. You should try to apply that to all of your classes and academic endeavors, but the Bible most of all. The second of our postulates is the speed of light and vacuum is the same in all inertial reference frames. So those are our two postulates. That's some pretty simple starting positions. That's not anything complex or difficult to work with. So how is that going to play out? <laughs> um, well, this is just a statement saying, you can kiss your intuition goodbye at this point. Everything that makes sense in life, that's not what we're going to be talking about. Some people like that. If Alex was awake, he would like it. Oh, I guess he is. <laughs> because it, it requires you to, to think differently, to think outside of the box a little bit. And as I've already said, we're doing special relativity here, not general relativity. Um, I can jump straight forward to the correspondence principle. The correspondence principle now becomes something of importance to us. The correspondence principle is a principle to help put your mind at ease again. It says that as we learn about new special cases of physics, relativity is a special case, special relativity is a special case that is only important if you have speeds that are greater than one-tenth the speed of light. Our special relativity calculation should exactly agree with our general physics understandings if we're in that region less than a tenth the speed of light. Which means nobody ever uses special relativity in the region of less than one tenth the speed of light because what's the point? Your calculations are the same, but the math is more uh, demanding with the special relativity. 
So that's the correspondence principle. Simultaneity is another important idea. Now I'm going to actually skip the simultaneity right now because I want to get to the uh, right. Because I yeah, I want to get past this and get to time dilation. So time dilation, we can do time dilation without the slides. Let's just skip past. Einstein said to understand what's going on with this car, this traveling light at the speed of light, what we really need is a good clock that we can understand. And so he said, I'm going to make a simple clock. My clock is a light clock. I have a light. The light flashes. And the light goes from the light bulb to a mirror and reflects back to a detector that's right beside the light bulb. So the time for a tick is the time it takes for that light to go from the starting location to the mirror and back to the detector. So if you have this clock set up in a railroad car, you have a distance D between the light and the detector or in the mirror. Yeah, okay. This is showing a little yellow ball for the light burst. And so you're going to have the time for a tick is the time for the light to come up here and come back down. Understand the clock? So let's calculate the time for a tick. Delta time for one tick is equal to how does time relate to distance and speed? Time is equal to distance. distance divided by speed. So it's going to be the distance divided by speed. I'm going to put L here for the distance it travels. Divided by the speed. The speed is the speed of light. Well, what is the distance it travels? If it's a distance lowercase d to go from the light to the mirror and lowercase d back, then it's just going to be 2 times that distance over the speed of light. That's the time for one tick of our clock. Pretty simple, right? And you're wondering, how does this get anywhere? Why did Einstein come up with something so simple? Well, then Einstein says, what if the train is moving? If the train is moving, then the distance that the light has to travel is farther. If you're standing on Earth and you look at the train moving, the person inside the cart, they're in an inertial reference frame and they see this time that we just calculated. 2D over C is the time for a tick. The person in the train sees that the light had to travel the hypotenuse. So this side here was D. This side here is the time for half a tick multiplied by the speed at which the train is traveling. So that's going to be the speed of the train multiplied by delta T prime over 2. Um, I better change it from black because that didn't show up very well. So that's the distance here. So what's the hypotenuse? It'd be what? You can say use the Pythagorean theorem. So the hypotenuse is going to be, okay, the total length is two times the hypotenuse, so I'm putting the two out front. And then we just use the Pythagorean theorem, square root of, the distance across squared plus what we just calculated, delta T prime over 2 times the speed it's traveling squared. So that's the length it has to travel to go up and back in the moving train. And so that means that delta T prime is equal to the length over C is equal to 2 square root so that's an equation for the time of the clock to tick when the train is traveling now if you look at that if there's a little bit of a problem with the equation it's not solved for time is it 
it has delta t prime in it twice. So I need to solve this for delta t prime. We're all pretty good at math. I am 100% certain of that. What is the first step I should do to solve this for delta t prime? I'm reasonably sure you're all good at math. I do what? Okay, let's square everything to get rid of the square roots. So I would have, okay, I thought that would be good, but it's not. Delta T prime squared is equal to four over, oh, I squared that already by accident, four over C squared times D squared plus delta T prime squared V squared. Well, now I have delta T prime two places. I'll move it across. Um, first, I will expand this for D squared over C squared plus four V squared over C squared delta T prime squared. So I shall subtract for V squared or C squared. Did I make a mistake? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Alex, because I would have gone to the end and said, uh-oh, what went wrong? So I'm going to subtract that minus V squared over C squared delta T prime squared from both sides. So I will have delta T prime squared times 1 minus V squared over C squared is equal to 4D squared over C squared. And at this point, it looks like I've gotten myself probably not very far. But we really are to the end of this line. Because we started by saying, if the train, the person in the train is going to measure delta T is equal to 2D over C. So 2D over C squared is 4D squared over C squared. That means that right here, I now have an equation to relate the time for a tick of the clock for a person standing on Earth with the time for a tick of the clock for a person that's in the train. So we can see how the time relates. What would you have always expected it to be? The same, that's what we would expect. But now we see it's not gonna be the same. Delta T prime is equal to delta T divided by the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. So the time for the clock to tick is different when measured in the train car as it is when measured standing on Earth, which is just bizarre. How can the time be different for the same physical thing? And so Einstein concluded then that time is not the same in every reference frame, that time flows faster or slower depending on the reference frame you're in. And so we go a step further and we say, well, some reference frame has to be our absolute reference. Now, if you look at this factor, I think it's called the Lorentz factor. One over the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. What is the minimum value that that can have? It can have a minimum value of one when V is zero. What's the maximum value it can have? The maximum value it can have is infinity as V approaches C at that it's approaching infinity. So gamma ranges from one to infinity. So for a reference point, we say, well, let's take the side where gamma was one. So our reference
We call it the proper time when the speed is zero. Now in my calculations, which reference frame saw the clock as moving a speed of zero? Was it the one in the car or the one on earth? In the car. So the one in the car, the one that I call delta T, was the proper time. So in this equation, that's the proper time. And since gamma is always greater than or equal to 1, we call this time here the dilated time. Hence, this equation is the equation for time dilation. Time is, the time per tick is longer measured outside of the reference frame of the clock. And this applies to everything. So if you are driving a car that's traveling at nine-tenths the speed of light, somebody standing on Earth is going to see your clock running with a very long tick. You'll see your clock as normal. You'll see yourself as aging normally. They'll see you as aging really slowly. Okay, so we'll pick up with that Friday.